much for coming. Such a lovely day. Um, I didn't actually expect anybody to come today with, with the sun shining. This is the, our summer in Aberdeen. So uh, thank you very much for coming today. We are. Um, this is our first uh, of a student curator uh, little talk uh, for our exhibition uh, Victorian Time: The Spirit of the Age. Uh, this is the first exhibition that has been curated by the Emblem students, uh, which is just um, launched this year, so we are so proud. Uh, this exhibition was done with, um, I have to say, blood, sweat and tears <laughs> of 12 dedicated um, students who worked around the clock, I have to say, to produce this exhibition. So I hope you enjoyed. You had to look. So uh, today, our talk today is about uh, Egyptomania and the interest in Egyptology during the Victorian period. And again, um, saying Victorian period, now I know that <laughs> there's no such thing. <laughs> um, it's like saying that the 70s and 80s and 90s are all the same period. So, so it is a sort of a very loose term. Okay? So um, today um, I'm going to just talk about the beginning of Egyptology and um, some of the researchers would say that Egyptology started by Bonaparte who decided to invade Egypt in 1798. Uh, and he pushed Egypt in the centre of the world, uh, the world stage at that time, uh, by sending all his scientists to study uh, ancient Egypt, study actually everything in, in Egypt. And they, they um, published this in Description de l'Egypte, which is a very uh, sort of well-known book that describes everything that you can imagine, everything that they saw in Egypt, they paint, they, they draw, they, they commented on, uh, and of course they found the Rosetta Stone, which I have a picture here. There's a the stone is actually in the British Museum. As I studied Egyptology for so many years, we only had a very a replica in the in the Egyptian Museum, and the replica was that size. So <laughs> I studied Egyptology thinking that there's a the stone is that size. Until I went to the British Museum, of course, I saw the real big uh, stone. Uh, the Rosetta Stone is written in three languages, and this allowed researchers and people who are working in, in uh, deciphering the language to be able to compare three different languages and manage to um, crack the code of, as you can say, of the ancient Egyptian language. So this was one of the big steps that sort of, um, you know, helped with the interest in, in Egyptology as well, because now we know what they are talking about, we know what they are saying. Um, Again, in the, I don't know if you all, have you all seen the stone? Very big. <laughs> okay. Um, these are one of the stereoscopic images, and again, I'm interested in photography as well. And one of the stereoscope viewers is actually on display on the showcase on the other room. Um, and this was here is the Egyptian hall in the Crystal Palace. Egypt was highly... Um, it represented in the in the crystal in the crystal palace in the uh, great exhibition, which was again um, sort of um, you know um, what's the word um, pushed through by Prince Albert. Um, and again, this is another image of the huge statues that were erected in the crystal palace. Can you all see? Okay. But again, they were interested in Egypt because of the romanticized view of Egypt. Again, the same thing that uh, Queen Victoria herself, she had all these romanticized views of Scotland, and what, that's why she came and she stayed in Balmoral. So this is one of the Egyptologists, and this, uh, Lorraine, and this is his, his uh, French actually, and this is one of his drawings of Egypt. Again, you can see the, the, the Nile, the boats, so very romanticized view. They also liked to, because the photographs at that time were black and white, and they wanted to get the real colors. So they, they started to do these um, little um, um, drawings, colored drawings, uh, of Egyptian ornaments, or Egyptian uh, temples as well. So you can see this is one of the books that we actually have in Aberdeen University. Uh, this is the Grammar of Ornament. Um, and the author went through the Middle East collecting uh, all the different um, motifs to, to incorporate in this book. And you can, if you, have, uh, you can actually have this, you can see this book in the collection of the Aberdeen University. Uh, this is one of my favorite pictures. This is typical um, Egyptologists in uh, the 19th century, they are wearing the typical sort of hats and of course the lady is sitting down and none of them is looking at the camera. 
It's just it's none of it. And they are not having none of it. They are tamper somewhere. They are looking absolutely somewhere else. <laughs> and um, of course, the lady is actually Mrs. Darcy. She's she's a you know a very uh, well known Egyptologist as well. Uh, and it is really nice to see the presence of a female in this surroundings as well, from this early stage. Um, again, when you think about engineering, if you think about the obelisk. And the obelisk as a symbol has been used tremendously throughout the Victorian uh, era. Uh, this one here specifically is in Balmoral, and the, the servants and the tenants in Balmoral, they built it to commemorate Queen Victoria, next to uh, another uh, uh, statue of Queen Albert that Prince Victoria herself actually uh, put there to commemorate her husband. But this developed maybe a bit earlier. Um, in 1877, uh, the Fidewi in that time, he sent um, obelisks as presents, as you can imagine. Um, you, know, you know, if you want, a, if you want a, an obelisk, you can absolutely take it. <laughs> there is no problem whatsoever. So this is the, um, what they call Cleopatra needles. And one of, this is in Alexandria, which is um, the harbour here. Uh, and they, transformed, they transported this huge obelisk through, from, from, from Alexandria over here to London, and there's another one in New York as well. And it, it has been an engineering, huge engineering project to transport this huge monument all the way, safely, to, to be erected in, in London. These images I actually found when I was researching Grand Bay's archival material, which is now in the collection centre. Uh, and they haven't been uh, seen before, so these, these images are from his material. Uh, Grand Bay is one of the famous Aberdonian um, uh, Egyptologist, he actually, uh, he studied medicine and he was sent, he, he actually went to Egypt to help with the cholera epidemic uh, there and of course he was given uh, the Bay title and uh, he was there when everything was getting discovered, uh, something like um, the great cache with all the mummies, all these objects that were discovered. This is uh, again the, um, uh, the obelisk in London, and the photo is taken by George Washington Wilson, again another Aberdonian, uh, famous, very famous photographer. He was photographer of the Queen, uh, and uh, I've been interested in his work throughout uh, researching the exhibition as well. It hasn't been just monuments, but also buildings, architectural elements were um, perfectly embedded in buildings like this one here, this is the Egyptian Hall in London, and we also have the Egyptian Hall in Glasgow as well, which I think was um, going through some um, sort of uh, restoration uh, recently. Um, again, this is Marshall Quadrangle, and of course it has to have an obelisk, you know. Every place has to have an obelisk, and of course there was this obelisk, which is made from red polished granite, uh, and um, it, was, it was given to the university by, um, let me remember his name, yes, uh, McGregor. And McGregor, again, very famous collector, um, decided to put this in the quadrangle. Now, of course, it's not there, it's in Duffy Park, so if you'd like to have a look. Um, I like the idea that um, George Washington Wilson couldn't fit the whole obelisk in the picture, so we're uh, missing the top. <laughs> this is Grand Bay, and of course he's wearing the famous fizz, uh, which was uh, to indicate his, his title. Uh, and this is one of the, again, from his archival material that hasn't been uh, seen uh, yet, um, and I'm probably planning to uh, do some more research on it later, uh, but this is one of the papyrus again discovered in Egypt at that time when he was there in 1881. Um, to sort of um, show you the, the sort of um, fantasizing about ancient Egypt and also the sort of um, um, way they represent, this is the same scene, this is the original scene and this is how it was drawn, this is supposed to be Cleopatra. And can you see the can you see the difference? This is how the watercolor of this same scene. Um, stop here. Because because of uh, all these great discoveries, um, all most of the people who were visiting Egypt were collecting. Uh, and of course, uh, we mentioned Grand Bay. These two shabtis are from Grand Bay. Shabtis were the perfect thing to collect. Ancient Egyptian produced a huge amount of shaptis. They were called the, uh, the answer. So they will have this magical uh, inscription, which is, uh, of course, the shapti, uh, the shapti chapter from, it's a very hard thing to say, <laughs> from the Book of the Dead. And when the deceased call 
the, cha the Shabti, the Shabti will answer, to do what? To work instead of him in the afterlife. Ancient Egyptians did not think that afterlife would just be to sit around and do nothing. You will have to dig canals uh, to, for irrigation, you will have to do a lot of work, which, in, 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 which includes carrying sand from one place to another, in the same time they didn't want to do it themselves. So the only way to do it is to have magical servants. <laughs> I thought about doing this for my essays, but it didn't really work. However, uh, you can see the difference. They were made of different shapes, they were made of different material, they were made of different sizes, and this was really uh, sort of ticked with, with, the, with the Victorians because they liked to classify things. So it, it fitted well with the classification of objects. You can see even the mount that they made for it looks like um, a pylon, which is again another ancient Egyptian feature. Um, this would be in um, similar similar chapters would be in, in uh, cabinet of curiosities in big houses like Bangry House. We know that there was a museum in Bangry House and we know that there was a lot of uh, collection uh, from all around the world. Actually Prince Albert visited this collection this is Thompson collection, and Prince Albert himself visited this collection when he was um, opening the music hall. Um, so these ones here are from Grand Bay collection, and you can see that they are, again, one is very colourful ones. Um, if you have a, a closer look, you will see that some of them will have little tools with them. Uh, for example, Tudak Amun had in his collection 410 chapters, one for each day, and then at the top, of course, there are supervisors, because you can't really trust charities, you know, <laughs> yes, they are magical, but in the same time, just in case if they didn't want to work one day. So, um, you can see that they have little hose and they have little baskets as well, which uh, in, in very, the very sort of complicated examples, they will have miniature hose and miniature um, baskets with them. Uh, these ones, I think you'll probably have hose. They were always in the mummy form, um, Way. So they are. They look like mummy. Standing mummy. Sometimes they have different headdress uh, and um, different. Uh, of course, the inscription. They will have the name of the person uh, inscribed. But of course, on the, on, uh, the shanty. Um, let me show you this one. Uh, of course, Egypt was going, as I said, through a very modernizing uh, period during that time, during the Victorian time. Um, and the Khedivi, uh, other than giving gifts. Uh, of obelisks, he also wanted to build an opera house. So he wanted to, he, the opera house was built, and he asked Verdi if he can write an opera for him. And Verdi agreed, and he wrote Aida. And this is one of the posters uh, that represents Aida. This is one of the early posters. A lot of people think that opera Aida was actually written to commemorate the opening of the uh, so it's canal, but actually, no, this is not true. It, it was opened, uh, it was written to commemorate the opening of the big opera. And you can see this is one of the costumes that was done for one of the characters. And it is very similar to the drawing at the top. Can you see the similarity? Um, again, in Glasgow, this one here is a commemoration because it's not just it's not just uh, people visiting, it's not just travelers, but also troops. These are the regiments. This is to commemorate the regiments that served in Egypt in 1882. And you can see, of course, the Egyptian influence all over uh, the memorial. This is one of the medals that if you served in Egypt, you would get this medal. And of course, you have the Sphinx on it, and you have Egypt. Um, and the very famous photo that every regiment served in Egypt had to... Um, pose in front of the Sphinx, and I believe this is an amazing link between Scotland and Egypt in the same photograph, so I absolutely love it. Um, this also, the, the interest in Egypt manifested itself in furniture, so you can see this cabinet, which is for coins cabinet, actually made originally for Napoleon, but it never reached him, and you can see all the different elements that represent Egypt. Uh, also in the UK, this um, candelabra here has Isis, um, the face of Isis and also different rosettes. Again, a very highly Egyptianized uh, sort of elements that has been incorporated within these uh, objects. Sometimes it's not that clear. Sometimes it is just like the, the scarabs here in these jewellery. And these are just the, the designs. And again, again, these were uh, all done during the Victorian era. Um, of course, for Grand Bay, 
uh, he had to have an obelisk, of course, uh, for his grave. So I, <laughs> I went to see his grave, and this is his, his grave with uh, a big, huge obelisk on top, which is, again, very popular uh, during this period. Um, this is this is all from me today. Thank you very much. And uh, um, if you have any questions, please fire away.